Hi, uh, Bob Beachel here, and uh, in this um, video we'll be looking at uh, ARIMA modelling. Okay, so what is ARIMA modelling? Well, it's a time series method, so you only need data on the th variable you're trying to uh, forecast, and it fits a specific statistical model uh, or equation to that data. Now the models, the equations that are fitted can be of three types a moving average model, autoregressive model, or a mixture of the two, an autoregressive moving average or an armor model. Now, an autoregressive model, uh, as the name tells you, models the current value of the variable on past values. So you can see that here where we've got yt, which is the current value, uh, is a function of, is, 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 a linear, is linearly related to uh, the last period's value, yt minus 1, two periods back, yt minus two, and so on as far as p periods back, hence ARP model. And uh, you need to estimate the coefficients, uh, phi one to phi p, and the constant. Notice, of course, it's not an exact fit to the data because there'll be some random error, some disturbance, and so we have that disturbance term ET. Now, moving average model models the current value on a weighted average of past errors. So here we have what's called an MAQ model, where the current value, yt, depends upon uh, errors, uh, the current error, et, one period back, et minus one, and so on. Uh, again, a linear relationship, so we have to estimate c and the various thetas, theta one to theta q. Now putting the two together, we have an armor model, where as you can see, we've got both an autoregressive element and the moving average element. Okay, so now here's a very important point that in order to carry out uh, RIMA modeling, the data that you're going to use uh, to estimate has to be stationary. Now, if you remember, a stationary data series is one with neither an upward nor a downward trend. The value of the variable will fluctuate around a constant mean. Now, it's often the case that the data that you're uh, wanting to forecast indeed does have a trend. So what you have to do is to first of all remove that trend and uh, focus on uh, a stationary data series. Now how do you do that? Well typically in ARIMA modeling you take the difference of the data, the change in the value from one period to the next. Now this is known as the first difference and it's shown there as delta yt, that big triangle is delta, and as you can see it's simply equal to the difference between the current value yt and what it was one period back. So it's, it's simply the change in the value of the variable from one period to the next. Now, normally, if you have some non-stationary data and you find the first difference, that first difference will be stationary, and that you can use that for the modeling. Occasionally, the first difference will still be non-stationary, and you have to take the first difference of that to give you what's called the second difference of the data. Now, the number of times you have to difference to uh, end up with a stationary data series is known as the order of integration, and that's what the I stands for, uh, and the D in the ARIMA PDQ model. AR, of course, is autoregression, MA moving average. I stands for order of integration. The number of times you have to uh, dif uh, difference in order to end up with a, da a stationary data series and that's indicated by the parameter d. So when you estimate this model, those are the three parameters you have to put into the software, as we'll see with SPSS. Now, actual process of um, ARIMA modeling essentially involves four stages. Firstly, identification, where you, first of all, test for stationary, check that the data is stationary, and if not, take the difference and so on until you uh, have a stationary data series. You then have to decide upon the values of P and Q. Now to do this, there's no hard and fast uh, rule for this. There's no speci uh, absolute specific way of doing it. You have to use certain judgments, but uh, there are certain rules, certain principles, which you can apply uh, to determine this, which we'll look at. Now, once you've determined uh, P and D, D being the number of differences, which is normally just one, and Q. 
You can then estimate the model using, say, SPSS. That will give you estimates of the coefficient values uh, and the associated t-statistics and p-values, because of course this is all based on a sample, so we need to test for statistical significance. Um, now, you also then, uh, uh, and the same principles apply here, these t-stats are not valid and so on, unless the residuals, uh, which are an estimate of the error term, are purely random. Uh, similar, of course, to multiple regression analysis. Uh, in fact, we talk about here the residuals being white noise, which means they're random, independent errors. Now, typically in ARIMA modeling, you don't check for this with, say, a Durbin Watt statistic. What you look at is what's called the ACF and PACF functions, the autocorrelation function, the partial autocorrelation function, uh, to check this. Once you're satisfied the residuals are random, then you have a possible model, but that may not be the model that you choose because you might find that another model using different values of P and Q also has random residuals. Now, how do you choose, therefore, between models like that? You look at the goodness of fit measure, typically and not R squared in this case, but something known as the BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion. And the one with the lowest BIC is the preferred model. So having finally uh, determined a model for forecasting, you can then use that model for forecasting and the SPSS will generate those forecasts for you. And also the big advantage here is that with it being a statistically based model, SPSS will also, as well as providing the forecast, uh, calculate prediction or forecast intervals around that forecast to give you an indication of the margin of error. So let's look at, have, at the um, identification stage, um, first of all. So what you need to do is to use the autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation function diagrams to try and identify the best values of P and, and, and Q. Uh, of course, you've already had to make sure that the data is stationary, which would give you the value of, of D. So how do you actually uh, do this? Well. As I say, there's, as I said before, there's no hard and fast uh, exact way of doing this, but there are a number of guidelines, and the two main ones are listed here. If you find that the ACF is declining quickly to zero, and then the PACF has significant spike, that is, values which are outside the, the bounds uh, that you'll see on the, on the chart, uh, lags 1 to P, P could be 2, could be 3, whatever, that suggests an ARP model. On the other hand, if the um, PACF declines quickly to zero and the ACF has uh, significant spikes, that lags 1 to Q, then it gives you an MAQ model. Now, of course, you could find that uh, both these things seem to be satisfied, that, and hence you might go for a mixed uh, uh, model, an ARMA, an armor model. Okay, so let's look at an example of how this works. So here's some example data taken from the um, book by Heinemann and Makradakis. It shows um, users uh, uh, on the internet, internet, number of internet users uh, each minute over a certain uh, uh, period of time. So looking at this data, uh, you can see that it definitely doesn't appear to be stationary. There's a slight tendency for there to be an upward trend for the gradual, the number of the fluctuations, obviously, but it's certainly not fluctuations around a constant mean. Now, if in fact you uh, look at the autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation functions, now what do I mean by that? Well, the autocorrelation shows the correlation between uh, one particular value and each value one period back. Uh, and then two periods back, and three periods back, and so on. So you have these correlations here uh, between uh, each pair of values uh, separated by a certain number of lags. The partial loss correlation function is similar, only it, avoid, it uh, ignores what are called intermediate correlations. Um, the details are not really uh, strictly necessary here, as long as you know how to, to interpret them. Now, if you look at the ACF here, for example, you'll see that there's lots of correlations. Notice the two horizontal lines there. Those are the uh, lines of significance. 
so that any bar which is above or below the line is significantly different from zero. Remember, of course, we're dealing with a sample, so we always have to uh, check for significance uh, things different from zero. So as you can see, there's a lot of correlations on the ACF which are significant, which suggests, of course, that the uh, data is not stationary. Um, similarly, the PACF has a couple of significant correlations. So this is typical of non-stationary data where the ACF does not decline quickly to zero or to being in, not significantly different from zero. That only happens at about, what, about lag 11 here. So this is definitely suggesting that the original data is not stationary. So what we have to do, of course, is to take the first difference, to find the change in the value from one period to the next. And here we can see a plot of the first difference. Now this does appear to be stationary. As you can see, there it's fluctuating, but it's fluctuating around to constant mean um, here uh, of about zero. So, and the other thing, in fact, to check uh, in terms of stationarity is that there's no tendency for the variance around the mean to widen. Uh, here, it seems to be remaining within reasonable bands. But in particular, the data does seem to be fluctuating around a constant mean. Now, this suggests stationarity. We can check this with the ACF and PCAF. And notice the difference here. The ACF is now declining fairly quickly to zero. By about lag six or seven, it's becoming, uh, the correlations are no longer significantly different from zero. So, and notice that there then, given that the ACF is declining quickly to zero, there are significant correlations. There are spikes on the PCAF at lags one, two, and three. So bearing in mind the general principles, the rules of thumb I mentioned earlier, that does suggest possibly an AR3 model. Now, you could also maybe here suggest that the PCAF is declining quickly to zero by lag four. It's, uh, the, the correlations are not significant, leaving you with, what, one, two, three, four, four, maybe, maybe five significant correlations on the ACAF. But here, more than likely, uh, an AR3 model is appropriate. Now, given that this data is the first difference, so we had to difference um, uh, once to get stationarity, we have what is, uh, seems appropriate here as an ARIMA 3 one naught model. Three being the three autocorrelation values, and one being because we had to difference once, and zero because we're not including any moving average elements. Okay, so uh, now we've uh, decided on an appropriate model. The next stage is estimation. So now you use some appropriate software, such as SPSS, that can estimate ARIMA models to estimate this ARIMA 310. And that will give you coefficient estimates, t-stats, p values, and so on. And also some uh, goodness of fit measures, in particular the BIC, which uh, is the one we're going to need to look at. Um, now, of course, you also need to make sure that uh, when you do the estimation that you get uh, the residuals, and in particular, the ACF and PACAF, PACF of the residuals, the, uh, uh, the autocorrelation function, the partial autocorrelation function, because we need those to check for uh, the residuals being white noise. Okay, so if you estimate this uh, model here, this REMA 310 model on the internet data, these are the results that you get. Um, and as you can see, um, we end up with a, a reasonable model um, where we've got um, coefficient values which are significantly different from zero. The T stats are okay. Um, uh, so this is looking reasonable from that point of view, but of course we then have to check first of all, the residuals. So that leads us into stage three, diagnostic checking uh, of the residuals in particular. Are they white noise? Are they purely random errors? Now, as I said before, in multiple regression analysis, you tend to use things like the Durbin-Watson statistic, but here we use the, a 
again the ACF and PACF that we saw when you uh, were looking for stationarity in the data. So if the residuals are white noise, there should be no significant correlations, no correlations which are significantly different from zero. So all the um, bars on the line should be within, uh, on the chart rather, should be within the bands. It's also possible to do a joint test of a number of uh, residuals to see if they're jointly equal uh, to zero. And that's known as the uh, Lung or Young Box Q star statistic. Uh, now, if the residuals are not white noise, then obviously the model is no good. You need to try a different one with different values for P and Q. Okay, so here we have the uh, ACF and PCF for the residuals of that model we estimated. And it's clear to see that these are fine. All the uh, bars are with it. Notice that the things are printed vertically rather than horizontally in this case. Uh, but you can see that all the bars are well within those uh, two lines. Uh, anything outside the line, remember, is statistically significant from zero. So none of these are. So it's suggesting there's no... Um, correlation between any of the residuals, they are random and independent, which is what we want. So this model, therefore, the ARIMA 310 model, does look to be uh, a possible candidate model for forecasting. However, what you should do here, I'm not going to do it uh, um, here in fact, but what you should do in practice is just to be sure, try some other candidate models, some other uh, using different values of P and Q as suggested by the uh, ACF and PACF as we looked at earlier using those two basic principles. Uh, estimate those and if they also have white noise residuals then the way to decide which model is best is then to look at the goodness of fit the BIC, I think it's what's called the normalized BIC in SPSS, go for the one with the smallest value. Now it turns out in fact here that if you do run additional models, the ARIMA 310 model is the best. So now that we've got decided upon a, a, the best model, the most suitable one, this can be used for forecasting. Now, if you want to do this manual, of course, we'd have to substitute values into the equation. But fortunately, uh, uh, SPSS and other software will generate these forecasts for you. Um, and as I said before, uh, it also very usefully calculates prediction or confidence intervals around those forecasts. So here we are. Here's what you would get from SPSS. There were 100 uh, values in the data set, 100 minutes. So I've asked it here to forecast for the next three minutes. And as you can see, it gives you the mean forecast, but an upper uh, limit and a lower limit to the prediction interval or confidence uh, interval. And of course, as forecasts go further into future, the uh, interval around the prediction interval widens because of course there's less certainty. So you get that typical, what's often known as a fan chart here, which you can see at the end. Okay, so that completes looking at ARIMA modeling. Now here's a couple of references which uh, you'll find useful. They refer, uh, both of them are uh, texts that have, uh, have been recommended as part of the general reading for this module. There's Hyman and Athanasolopoulos's book, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, which is the online text, which of course is very, very useful. And then of course there's the earlier uh, textbook um, that uh, by Makridakis uh, et al., one of the etals being, one of the others being Heinemann, uh, which uh, is also worth looking at.